Hello World Civilizations class, Mr. Lassiter with you. Today as we start our new unit on the age of exploration, colonization, uh, the scientific revolution, and absolutism. Basically a lot of stuff is going to happen in the next 200 or 250 years of history that we're going to study. And it's going to be focused mainly on Europe. So we want to start with Europe, which is actually where we left off in our last unit. Uh, and look at them on the eve of this, what we call, Age of Exploration. So, uh, the Age of Exploration is a time period when Europeans uh, explored the African coast, uh, began moving into the Indian Ocean for trade, and then, of course, uh, began uh, trading with the New World uh, and colonizing the New World after uh, Columbus's voyage. So what are our questions to consider today? Well, first of all, what was Europe's position in the world prior to the Age of Exploration? So before uh, they start looking outward in the, in the 1400s, what, uh, what is their position? Um, secondly, what were the motives for Europe to explore? Why all of a sudden did they go from a kind of an isolated society to one that was trying to trade? And lastly, what developments in Europe led to the success of these expeditions? Why all of a sudden could Europe trade across the world? Uh, so we have a lot of vocabulary terms here. The Ottoman Turks. This phrase that you'll hear a lot. God, glory, and gold. And then some uh, technology that develops. Cartography, the compass, the astrolabe, uh, the caravel, and the Lantine sail. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's remember, in the Middle Ages, Europe was fairly isolated from the rest of the world. Even though there was a lot of interaction between the Holy Roman Empire and England and France and the Italian states, um, we don't see uh, Europe necessarily being very engaged with Africa and Asia. Um, and this is kind of, at during the Crusades, that they, they do engage with it. And that's kind of the beginning of Italy getting back into this idea of what's going on in the Middle East, let's trade with them, and then, of course, leading to the Renaissance after about 1100. But for the most part, the rest of Europe, especially Northern and Western Europe, was really isolated. Um, so after 1100, we have the Italian city-states engage in trade with the Middle East. Shortly after that, we'll see the Renaissance, etc. Um, we have that kind of 200 year period where we have European kingdoms constantly fighting with each other, developing new technology like the cannon, um, competing with each other economically. Also we have these kings trying to centralize their governments. So all this is, is going on. That's kind of where we left off. And that's where we're what we're going to see in Europe basically in the late 1400s on the eve of this exploration. So what were the motives? Well. Well, keep in mind, for almost a thousand years, Europeans remained isolated in one area of the world. But they had always been attracted to Asia. For example, the stories of Marco Polo that we read also inspired many Europeans uh, to travel east. So they would travel over land to try to trade with the Middle East or India or China. Um, but that was very limited. And it became even more limited when the Ottoman Turks... Uh, conquered the Middle East in the 1300s. Basically, they started an empire, and they, uh, as you see on this map, they're based out of Turkey, but they conquered parts of Greece, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, and Persia. So the Ottoman Empire had become fairly large, and that restricted European trade greatly. Europeans then needed a new way uh, to the Middle East and to uh, East Asia, and they decided to do this by sea. Um, and you can actually see on this map some of the earliest Portuguese voyages uh, beginning in the early 1400s and really culminating in Vasco da Gama arriving in India in 1498. It's kind of a hundred year, nearly 100 year process to try to bypass the Ottoman Empire and trade with India. So what caused Europeans to undertake these journeys? I mean, because they were dangerous. Um, we're talking, if you, if you kind of equate it to uh, modern trips to, into space and man's trip to the moon. I mean, these, these journeys were, were perilous. They were very difficult. Um, so, so what made them want to go? 
Well, one Spanish adventurer wrote that he went to Americas to, quote, give light to those who were in darkness and to grow rich as all men desire to do. So giving light to those who are in darkness, he's talking about uh, converting people to Christianity and, of course, to grow rich. And, of course, you grow rich, it's going to bring a lot of uh, notoriety. So this one phrase kind of wraps it all up. God, glory, and gold. What caused Europeans to undertake dangerous journeys? Those three things. So what were the religious motives? Well, most hoped to introduce Roman Catholicism to natives in other lands, uh, especially the Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, they even, as you see in the picture uh, with Columbus's ships, on their large sails, they were emblazoned with crusader crosses. Because just like the crusades looked to bring Christianity back to the Middle East, uh, these Spanish and Portuguese explorers hoped to bring Christianity to people who did not know about it. Of course, there were individual motives, many looking for glory, others looking for adventure. Uh, people like uh, um, Hernando de Soto and uh, Pizarro kind of went out looking to find great civilizations to conquer. Uh, Cortez, of course, before Pizarro um, conquered the Aztecs. So we learned all about that. And lastly, economic motives. Uh, they wanted to expand trade, especially for spices in the East. Uh, and in, when doing that, they wanted to avoid the middleman. Uh, they didn't want to have to trade to get things from India by trading with somebody in the Middle East because that meant they were paying higher prices. If they could bypass that person in the Middle East, uh, then it would be much cheaper. And they also wanted to open new markets for European goods. And lastly, they wanted to find silver and gold. So what made the voyages possible? Well, what we, what we really see in Europe is uh, certain scientific uh, and technological advancements that allow Europeans uh, to um, to reach, to go further uh, and across oceans. And again, if we use our kind of our space analogy, this is kind of like rocket technology. You know, when humans find out how to get something into space, then we can uh, figure out how to do it better and better and better and go further and further. Um, but the science of technology really comes um, out of European monarchs increasing their power, uh, and resources. They, they were always competing with one another. So the European country with the best cannons would be the strongest uh, of the European nations. And so they would try to increase military technology. The Europeans with the best navy or the best ships would be the strongest naval power. So they were trying constantly to increase uh, this technology. And then also as they came into contact more and more with the Middle East, we see technological advancements in mathematics, mapping, sea travel, and even warfare. Um, basically, things borrowed from the Middle East and brought to Europe uh, and then expanded on. So, for example, the use of uh, some of the things we're going to see in the next slide. So, much of European sailing knowledge, uh, including charts of coastlines, mathematics, they came chiefly from the Middle East. Um, for example, the Cartography, or the art and science of match, map making, became much more accurate and important. And some of the best maps in the world were developed by Middle Eastern explorers. The compass, which you see in the picture on the bottom right, measured directions, and the astrolabe there at the top left, uh, were, which measures a person's latitude based on the position of uh, the sun and the moon and stars, etc., they were perfected in the Middle East. Even though they weren't necessarily developed there, they were perfected there, and they greatly aided exploration. And Europeans basically just borrowed what already worked and then sought to improve it. And one of the most important uh, of these developments in science and technology were the caravels, which were small ships uh, which were developed in Europe they were extremely maneuverable and could carry very heavy cannons and many goods. So they were very quick. Uh, they were excellent in battle, even though they were very small. Uh, so small, in fact, that when Vasco da Gama arrived in India, uh, the traders in India laughed at him because of the size of their ships. They had seen these great big uh, ships from China 
uh, which were four and five times larger than these caravels. And they just thought, well, these people are insignificant coming in these little tiny ships. But what they didn't know is they were extremely maneuverable, they were excellent in naval warfare, and they carried these heavy cannons, which could do great damage to coastal cities and other ships. One of the reasons these ships were so maneuverable is the adoption of what we call lanteen sails. Basically, lanteen sails are just triangular sails. Um, and they were developed in the Indian Ocean and used by people in the Middle East. And Europeans borrowed them, so to speak, so basically stole the good ideas, and combined it with kind of these large rectangular sails uh, to make the ships very maneuverable and very efficient in sailing. So, lots of technology here, I know, but cartography, the development of the compass and the astrolabe, and these new types of ships made Europeans uh, much stronger uh, ocean-going nations. So take a look at the question to consider again, make sure that you get the vocabulary, there are a lot of important terms, uh, but this was Europe on the eve of exploration, going from isolated to looking outward in the world. All right, that's it, guys. We'll see you tomorrow.